This is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budget, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow, all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite. And right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at NetSuite.com slash C-Suite. Head to NetSuite.com slash C-Suite for special end-of-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. NetSuite.com slash C-Suite. Hey, everybody, it's Mark Pattison back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And before I get into today's amazing guest, I just want to draw attention again to my website, www.markpattisonnfl.com. And again, you can go and see over 225 of these amazing uh, episodes, uh, which you can find anywhere you find podcasts out on the Internet. And there are, again, incredible people doing extraordinary things like today's guest. Also, there's a button that can be directed to the NFL's film Searching for the Summit, which is now on YouTube. You can check that out. 30 minute documentary of my Everest journey, which was talking about extraordinary, (laughs) extraordinary And then finally, I continue to raise money for higher ground. I've started a campaign called Amelia's Everest, and I continue to hone on that because we continue to raise money for that great cause, which goes 100% directly to higher ground. So on that note, let's get into today's guest. I've got a really remarkable story. Robert Paler, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Mark. So excited to be here. Yeah, so, uh, I, you know, I started digging into this story, and, and your story is really interesting to me because as a former wide receiver in, you know, the high school level, the college law level, and the NFL level, I what, what happened to you was always like my worst nightmare, right, of a wide receiver getting strung out from a quarterback, a bad quarterback throw, and put you in some really awkward positions. And for you back in 19, uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, 2017, you're a rugby player. That's your background. You're a big, strong, physical guy. I've seen you on film and really a pretty intimidating figure, you know, compared to the other guys that were out there. And you guys are a very physical bunch. And, you know, to see you guys get in this scrum, I'm, I'm surprised not more people are hurt. But for you on that day, why don't you describe and set up like how the events played out, which puts you in your position um, where you, where you sit, you know, as of, uh, as of now. Yeah. So May 6, 2017 was the day easily the day I will remember better than any else for the rest of my life. Um, competing in the sport of rugby in the collegiate rugby national championship for the Calman's rugby program. I grew up kind of playing the, you know, all American, like three sports, football, basketball, baseball, and in high school, um, found this sport of rugby through Jesuit high school you know, over in the Sacramento area, the most successful rugby program there is at the high school level. I think there's 10 national championships now with the program being around for just about 25 years. Um, So pretty good success rate there looking at this program. And that's where I fell in love with this sport and learned the sport and then found my way over to Cal, which is bar none, the number one program in history uh, for, for American rugby, but really any sport, any level, any gender, we've experienced the most success. That day we were fighting for our 31st national championship. I think the only team that has more championships than that is the Harlem Globetrotters and their games are rigged. So we were doing all right. Uh, And I'm starting as a sophomore on this team. I'm playing the lock position, um, which is kind of like the body type and skill set of a tight end in football where, you know, I'm at the time 20 years old, 6'5", 245, so pretty big body, Um, but I've got to be able to move this field for 80 minutes of 
a continuous play. There are no breaks. There's, there's no, there's no water boys going out there to, to get you fueled up and stuff like that. I mean, you really got to be able to empty your tank out there on that field. And I was known for kind of my physical play, the workhorse of the team. I wasn't getting the ball a ton. I wasn't like doing a lot of the scoring, but I was setting that up, putting my head in those spaces where other people might not put their heads. And it was about a minute and a half into this game as we're playing Arkansas State that we're competing what's called a mall. And for those of who don't know rugby, a mall is one of the bigger guys. We group together in a single unit. And then we push to advance the ball and the defense's job is to come straight in and stop us from pushing forward. And it's the boiler room, you know, it's where the big guys thrive. And this was my element. I mean, I'm like drooling here on this field. I think let's go Rob, drive this thing in. Let's pound this thing in early. And I'm going to get my back padded tomorrow in film session. And it starts getting ugly pretty quick. There's a lot of rules that start being broken. So first a player enters in from the side, which in the sport of rugby, you're not allowed to do in these malls. And as he comes in from my left side, he takes his left arm, he binds me in a headlock. He takes my, he takes his right arm and he hooks my leg. Both of these are penalties, but that bind around that the head um, in that neck lock, that's an automatic yellow or red card in the sport of rugby. We don't play advantages. We don't let this, this play finish the referee raises his arm and blows his whistle and then gives that player either a yellow or a red card, depending on the severity of the injury. Um, but still the referee's not calling anything. So two more players coming from the side. I'm continuing to push forward. I'm, I'm doing what I can to drive this, this mall in. This is my job right now. I'm in the heat of this moment of the national championship, this other guy comes in and he comes in really low. He sort of chops me down by my legs, another penalty. So I start falling. And now this isn't an uncommon thing for these malls to collapse. I'd say about half of these malls collapse. So I'm kind of just going through, you know, routine collapse mall where, you know, I hit the deck, I pop right back up and I go on to the next phase of play. But in this one, as this, as I was going down, this player, he improves his headlock around my neck. My chin is severely pressed against my chest. I just remember I closed my eyes, I grip my teeth. And then it was just like, poof, I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't move anything. I was lying there with my face in the dirt, screaming. I'm doing everything I can to get up, but I can't move a muscle. And my mind just immediately starts starts running wild. I'm thinking, am I going to be able to play rugby again? You know, am I going to go to school? Am I going to like have a good career? And, you know, one me one day I'll meet a girl, get married, start a family. I mean, all of those things were an extreme question. I was just thinking at that point, like, am I even going to be able to feed myself again? I couldn't wiggle my fingers. I couldn't move my arms. I couldn't, I couldn't wiggle my toes. I, I couldn't even, even feel it. And at that moment, things seemed, seemed very bleak and it was, it was absolutely horrifying. Yeah. I'm just sitting here absorbing what you just said. And I can only imagine how terrifying this would be um, probably about a year ago. I spoke to a kid who played small college ball back in the Midwest and he ran down on a kickoff and, you know, just took the wrong hit. And, and mm -hmm. that's what happened as you were telling that story. And then we'll kind of get into part two of this. Um, as you were telling that story, the, 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 the opposing player for Arkansas state that had you in this kind of death grip lock around your neck, have you ever communi communicated with him? Has he ever reached out? No, he has never reached out and he's never said he's sorry. Now I'm four and a half years into this, this injury since, since that happened on May 6, 2017. And not once have I received any kind of communication with this person. And, you know, what made this so frustrating is at first we didn't exactly know how this injury had occurred. It was it was very quick and the game footage had a, had a bad angle. We couldn't really see what happened. The ball collapsed and one person didn't get up. And, you know, I was just having to, to deal with that situation and, you know, the, the surgery, pneumonia, inability to swallow that I had in that, in that very initial stage. And it was probably about three days into this that um, my coaches gave the folder to my dad and, and sent a video over of some very clear sideline, um, an end zone footage and uh, both in still shots and video of what happened to me, which was clearly a strong bind around my neck, which is 
extremely illegal in the sport of rugby, clearly illegal, which caused my paralysis and really my face to slam against my chest as the top of my head stayed in one position and my body rolled over it. And uh, I immediately, when I looked at those pictures and saw that video, I was filled with rage like I've never felt before. It was just this hate and um, uh, just feeling of complete animosity towards another human being that I've never had. Because in a contact sport, you know, when someone hits you, you hit them back harder. Someone punches you, you punch them back and you punch them back harder. That's kind of just like how I, you know, how it was like played in these contact, contact sports. That's just, that's the mindset and to, you know, to be stronger, to be physically tougher. And, you know, here a person just, just put me on my back and I couldn't get up. I felt so helpless and, and just filled with all this rage. And I'm a, I'm a man of God. My faith is very important to me. And also just my, my ability to control my mindset, and, you know, my, my feelings and uh, make logical decisions going forward was so important to me at that point where I had to make the real conscious decision to forgive this person. So, you know, people would ask me and I'd have my own internal dialogue saying, you know, Robert, what do you think about this person? What's your take on this? And no matter how much anger I was feeling, I would always say, I forgive this person and I wish him well. Even though on the inside, I didn't feel it at all. That is not what I wanted to be saying. But deep down, I knew that by not forgiving this person, the only thing I was doing was hurting myself. And I think forgiveness is always the answer, whether that be when someone does wrong to us or whether that be even when we're just kind of mad at a situation. You know, when it seems like the universe is just against you, when we can put those things in the past and look forward that's when we get the power back. Because if I were to hold a grudge and continue to live in anger these last four and a half years, I certainly be where I am today. And I certainly want to be as happy as I am today. So it was a real process for me to reach that state of where I could say I forgave a person and I could feel it as well. But it was absolutely the, the right decision to do. And here I am today, completely freed of all that anger. Yeah. I mean, that's really hard to do, right? I mean, because... Yeah. That's just called natural human emotion. And with human natural human emotion, you know, that's 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 easy to say and really hard to do because, mm-hmm. like you said, those things are churning inside your gut and that those are what's really going on with inside you. But as you pointed out and you said that you can't fly high if you have negative weight on your back, mm-hmm. right? And especially I think there's 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 two different levels here. There's there's the level of, 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 we all go through that. doesn't matter if you've got everything working the way it should be working. And it adds a whole nother layer when every single inch and ounce of your positive energy needs to go towards your healing and not towards others who may or may not have contributed to the situation. It's the fates. It's what happened. I'm sure I could have taken a thousand hits and any one of those hits could have ended up, um, you know, in the same situation that you're in today. But, you know, what, what, what's really interesting to me is maybe you've always had this, maybe it was your parents, maybe it was your mom that stood by you, you know, all those hours where you're going through this rehab, because I know like when the doctor comes in and says, Hey, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, listen, listen, you're never going to walk again. That that's just a hard thing to swallow. And I'm trying to understand what the transition on two levels that for you to, what was your arc? What was the time length where you went from all the hurt and despair and anger and frustration and all that stuff to, you know what, I'm going to prove these doctors wrong. And, and, and kind of like from, from when you first hopped on this podcast before we went live, you know, you've got a great energy, you've got a great spirit about yourself. And that is so much about the human spirit of, you know, pushing your, yourself when it comes to the world of possibility. You know, anything can, anything can happen. And certainly we'll get more into that here, but, but what, again, what was that timeline for you to kind of go through those, those different phases of, of despair and ultimately hope to where you are today? Mm-hmm. The decision to fight this injury was made on, on the first day. So, mm-hmm. you know, I got onto that stretcher and over to the hospital, we do our medical imaging and uh, you know, this whole time I'm kind of holding out hope that this might just be like a stinger, um, something where my nervous system was just in shock, but no permanent damage was done. And, you know, I'm going to go back to school next week and do my finals is is what I'm really hoping for. But, you know, it's a bleak hope and I'm, I mean, I'm barely holding on to that, but, but hoping that it gets there. 
And then you're right. My doctor comes in. He just doesn't, he just, he doesn't just say, I'll never walk again. He says, you will never move your hands. You will be lucky if you can do something like pick up a piece of pizza and bring it to your face. So things like playing rugby is impossible. I mean, you, you should hope to be able to, to go back to school, you know, whether that be at Cal or maybe somewhere closer to where you live in the Sacramento area or, you know, very basic things, Robert, you need, you need to, to, to get on board with that right now. And he, he didn't even stop there. He's recommended a surgery to me, the spinal fusion surgery through the front of my neck. They had the incision site done right here to the side of my esophagus. And there's a lot of important real estate right here. You know, he's, he's explaining to me, we're dealing with fractions of millimeters to, to have the precision to perform a surgery like this. And with my situation already being very deconditioned, I was spiking fevers up to around 105 five degrees. My body was completely broken. He said, I might not even survive this surgery. And, you know, that's when, that's when my hope was getting pretty crushed. He said, my odds of walking again were probably somewhere in the range of 2%, 1% or less. And, um, before I could go into the surgery, which I had 30 minutes to make the decision on if I wanted to go into it or not, said I can make some phone calls. So actually the first phone call I made was to my religious advisor. And I wanted to ask for prayers that he sent a priest over to my room before the surgery so I can get the sacrament of anointing of the sick. So that if I die, I will be more likely to go to heaven. I mean, that's how serious this was yeah. dealing with my mortality at the age of 20. And uh, he says he'll do that. But before he hangs up the phone, he gives me this piece of advice. And it gave me like, it gave me power in a powerless situation. And he said, Robert, throughout this journey, there's going to be a lot of things that you just can't control. But the one thing you can control is your mindset. So your positivity, your ambition, your willingness to wake up every day and fight, that's up to you. And this injury can't take that away from you. So in that moment, I didn't have a lot. You know, I didn't have the odds on my side. I didn't have some doctor saying that everything was going to be okay or signs of life showing up in my body, but I had that choice to give it everything I had. Like I had, I had that decision, the power of a choice within me to keep moving forward, to take, to go into the surgery and, and start to do my best to kind of like get those emotions and the fear and terror out of the way and start making really rational logical decisions that are going to help me do best. And in that moment, I was kind of just thinking, I've got one life. We all have one life. And every day that passes is a day that will never come again. And I will not spend one of these days quitting. I won't spend one of these days trying to just, you know, come to terms with something. I mean, I wanted to fight this. And then in, and then in the end of the day, whether I was walking or I wasn't walking, I know I gave it everything I had. And that's the decision that was made then. Of course, it's a constant battle between, you know, positivity and fighting those negative emotions. It's something that I continue to deal with to this day. But that goal of walking again, that was that was a day one goal that, that I've been on ever since 1669 days later. Yeah. So have you have you gone through also and this is the last time I'll ask you about this, this type of of logic. But, you know, have you gone through the why me? Of course I have. Absolutely. I have. And, um, and I think it's been probably like a three year process before I could really actually answer that question <clears throat> because rugby was my purpose in life. I mean, I love being an athlete. It was my worth. It was my accomplishment. And you know, I could share this, this, uh, this game with people younger than me and, you know, give them passion and, and, and skill to be good at something in their lives. I mean, some of my greatest experiences and lifelong relationships were made, you know, on the rugby team, whether they be on the pitch in the locker room, on, in the bus, stuff like that. And, you know, one moment because of something that I couldn't control, it was gone forever. I was never going to have that ever again. And there was nothing that I could do about it. But I lost my purpose. Like I lost a lot of my identity and life. And as this story has gone on, and I've been able to share it and really think deeply about the tools that have helped me overcome this challenge that other people can use to overcome the challenges in their lives and inspire other people. It's answered that, that question of why me? Because the scope of how this story has been able to impact people is extremely humbling and, um, and gives me that purpose that I lost 
when I wasn't able to play the sport of rugby anymore. I mean, I wake up every single day looking to make an impact on someone else's lives, you know, whether that's with a podcast like this or posting a daily rehab video, whatever it is, um, doing something every day to take what happened to me, which would seem like nothing but a curse and turn it into a gift. And that's a gift that I can share with someone else. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I was chosen for something like this. You know, yeah. it's not like God didn't break my neck. There was no higher power that broke my neck. Mm -hmm. No, it was a player from Arkansas state that broke my neck, but being able to take this and turn it into something beautiful that I can give it to someone else. And it, it, I don't, I don't feel pity and I don't want anybody else to feel pity for me. Um, this is, this is a gift that I'm on. I'm very yeah. proud of this life. Well, that's the right way to look at it. And I, I like to turn that those words around. Like I said, you know, if I ask you the question of like, why you, why me? And, and I, I like to put it the other way around because I've had to answer my own question of some of these different things I've done mm -hmm. um, of why not me? Like yeah. why, you know, because so often when you, when you set high goals, like why can't you be the part of the 1% or actually no 1% you're never going to 1% you are going to walk 99% you're not going to walk. Mm -hmm. Why can't you, why can't you be that 1%? Why can't I be the part of the 1% to play in the NFL? Why not me? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, but a lot of times your ceiling is your brain, right? Mm -hmm. On what's going between your ears um, as you've experienced. So, okay. I wanted to ask you about your parents yeah. from their perspective, because I'm a parent too. I've got a 25 year old, you're 25 years old uh, now. And, and I, I, I just, I can't imagine what that would have been like for them from their perspective, not from your perspective, from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so what was that like? I know they were there to support you and everything, but you know, from their side of the fence, like how did they respond to all this? It was easily one of the hardest things for me when I had to first talk to my parents there laying on that field for the first time. And I can only imagine what they were thinking because when I was on that field, I mean, I looked like a corpse. I was not moving. I was barely breathing, but I was completely conscious in my head and, you know, able to communicate and observe what's going on. And, um, and I always tried to be so strong for them. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to make my parents proud and, I mean, in this moment, I was weak. I was broken. And when they came over, my dad took a knee to my right side. He, he grabbed my hand and I couldn't feel it. And my mom was right behind me. And there was no cliche of saying, everything's going to be okay. This mm -hmm. is going to be okay, Robert. But, I mean, in this moment, it was not okay. Um, and we knew we had, we had the, the challenge of our lives ahead of us to overcome this. But, but I, the one thing I do remember them saying, and it's stuck with me and it's, and it's been true ever since is, is we will never leave you, Robert. I, we, we are with you to the end. And I mean, through my tears, all I could say was I love you more than anything in the world, just saying it on repeat over and over and over again. And, um, and my family stepped up in a lot of ways. And my mom, she slept on a chair by my bedside for about four months. And whether that was, pounding down on my lungs so that I could work mucus out of it. as I was fighting pneumonia or, I mean, she wiped my tears. She was just, she was even just someone to talk to. I mean, I would not have done this without her. And um, my father was practically working another part-time job, trying to work with insurance and hospitals to get me in the best facility that I could be in for my, for my recovery. I mean, I just, family is, is the most important thing to me in my life. And I would say in the beginning and say it now, I would give anything to be able to walk again, except my family and friends. And mm -hmm. they stepped up in so many ways. I mean, that, that includes my brother as well. And I remember um, I was really, he actually wasn't at the game. He was taking his SAT that day. And, you know, he got the phone call, the news of what had just happened and was told to get down to Santa Clara where I was, where I was in this hospital and competing um, as quick as he could, because I might not wake up from this surgery. And um, here's another person who I always try to be so strong for and, and be a good role model to. And I couldn't be strong in this moment anymore. And I was, I was fighting so many negative emotions. I told my mom, you have to tell him before he gets in this room that he's not allowed to cry. And, and he's not, he's not allowed to be, to be sad or break down. I, maybe that's selfish, but you know, it's just, I just couldn't handle it. I couldn't take on anymore yeah. of that negativity. And man, he was probably one of the most strong people on that day. He is the person who held the phone in front of me as I FaceTimed all my closest friends. I, 
told them what happened that you know, I was going to the surgery. I, I might not make out of it. And I just want to let them know I love them. And I mean, he held the phone there. He might have dabbed a tear or two from his eyes. And he was, he was typing out messages as I dictated to him to send to my, my closest friends and my teammates. And um, I mean, he, he stood there for me and he stood, stood by my side ever since. I, I can't even explain what, what my parents have gone through um, throughout all this, but I think on the other end of it, they would say now it's, it's nothing but pride and um and something that that they're happy happy to be a part of and you know are and so are so happy that it's turned out well and also that that entire time my mom says this all the time that i was always still me you know mm-hmm. i was i was i was always the same person and i you know i could speak to them and i had my same personality i just had a serious physical goal to overcome here but the impact that it's made it's made on the world and, um and coming out of it on the other end you know, not just moving my body a lot better now, but with a true purpose in life and an impact on the world. Um, I think it's just, it's pure pride for all of us. So let's talk about the 1%. Uh, I did see some videos where, you know, you're moving your arms, you're, you know, for those who are listening, we're, we're doing a, a YouTube, this will be on YouTube. So if there are people on YouTube, you can see you're moving your hands and yeah. your face and everything's all good. And for those who, who can only uh, hear this uh, on via the audible, you do have that movement. Um, I did see the videos I mentioned that that you were up and you were walking. Um, and, and so tell me more about that. Like, what were the the stages where you're starting to wiggle your toe? I saw that last night, your, your finger. Mm-hmm. So obviously these things come in incremental, you know, wins. And, and all the way to, I'm sure there's a, still a long way to go, but but like, what to, let, give us an idea where that where that sits today. Yeah. So when I started out, you know, when I was first injured, I couldn't move or feel anything below about my collarbone level. So I could shrug my shoulders up. That was pretty much it. And um, as my spine started coming out of spinal shock, I was able to, I had good strength, pretty good strength in my shoulders. So I could, you know, I could lift my arms up and my biceps as well to, to be able to curl my arm up and, and some in my wrists as well, which is extremely helpful with an injury like this but nothing in my triceps. You know, I couldn't lift my arm above my head, nothing in, in my fingers, um, making it extremely challenging to be able to get throughout the day. And then about from halfway down my chest down, no motion at all. Nothing, not as, as hard as I close my eyes and grip my teeth. I wasn't getting a flicker, but I did have like deep pressure sensation. So you can put a knife in my leg at that time. And it wouldn't have hurt, but I would have, you know, felt that something's there. And when you're an injury like this, things become very relative, very quick. And having something as simple as just that deep pressure um, was a really great sign for my recovery. So in the first, gosh, about month, I wasn't really able to even do much rehabilitation because I was fighting pneumonia and, and inability to swallow at that time. So what I would do is I would try to move every muscle group in my body from head to toe. So I would start with something I could move like my, um, like with my traps here, moving my shoulders up and I would lift my arms up off the ground. Then I'd start with things I couldn't move. So, you know, closing my hand, opening my hand, I do 20 reps of each muscle group, you know, working through, through my chest and all my core muscles through every muscle, my legs, all the way down to my toes. And all right, I'd be sitting here like pretty tired, you know, definitely mentally, but also physically just kind of like taken from working so hard to get these things to contract and closing my eyes and envisioning it, but nothing happened happening and just, and staying on it every single day, multiple times a day, even though I wasn't getting any signs of life and my doctors weren't telling me to expect any signs of life. And it was about six weeks into my injury that I could look down at my hand and just see a flicker of movement in one of my fingers or look down at my toes and, you know, that nasty cleat feet that I, <laughs> that I had from having my, having my feet jammed up in cleats for so long. And, yeah. um, you know, see a, see a toe wiggle there. And when I went to the second hospital, their outlook was so different. And when I first came in there, they said, uh, you know, Robert, what happened to you is catastrophic, but we don't know where you're going to progress from here. The one thing we can guarantee you is we're going to give you everything that we have to optimize this recovery. So when they saw stuff like that, it wasn't saying anything like, oh, you know, don't, don't get your hopes up. And they were really, you know, intrigued by it and thinking how we can turn something as small as wiggling my toe 
you know, to like put me in a walking apparatus. And I'm thinking like, I don't think you understand here. I can wiggle my toe, but I yeah. can't like get up and walk. But, you know, with, with just that optimism and the power of modern science and medicine, I was, it's like building a skyscraper brick by brick and taking a little signal that's making it past this snip in the spinal cord and, and then using something like that to build more connections to where now I can engage every muscle in my body to some degree of strength. And it allows me to be able to stand up out of my wheelchair into my walker on my own. And I can walk about 300 yards now and it continues to progress. Wow. So the great thing about that is that the upside of hope, right? I mean, because at the end of the day, that's what we're all holding on to when some mm -hmm. adversity hits us all. It's like, what's the path? What's the path out? And maybe you're never going to be an Olympic sprinter, but going from you're never going to walk again, again, going in that 1% of moving your arms, moving your legs, and you're only 25. And so, you know, probably the good thing, you know, the, the, the good and the bad thing, the bad thing being so tragic because you're so young, but the good thing, you're, you know, strong body, yeah. you got your muscles, you know, there's a lot of things going for you, you know, with that. So it, it's, it, it sounds like it's been a very positive recovery to get you literally back on your feet and to go 300 yards is a long way. I mean, that's seriously a long way. It's amazing to be able to take two steps um, is a really big deal after having an injury like this, let alone 300 or more steps, you know, in what's a relatively short time frame of about four and a half years after my injury. And, and I'll be honest with you, I had way more bad workouts than good workouts. There's sometimes I will spend two months just trying to match a previous PR and man, I'll get like half of my PR or a quarter of my PR. I'm thinking like, you know, man, I've been doing this for over 1600 days now. And I mean, this is, this is what I get for putting in that much effort consistently and exhaustingly. I mean, it's, it's really a struggle. It's not, it's not a comfortable thing for me to do to get up and walk. I'm giving everything I have just to put my foot mere inches in front of the other. So I, you have to like have a really strong perspective, the right perspective to be able to take little gains and keep that motivating you forward because for me and for a lot of us on the path to success there's gonna be a lot more bad days than good days so i mean you, you definitely you have to be able to appreciate those good days when they come and and have a good vision for what you're looking to achieve going forward because those why questions they surface all the time you know and i've been able to to push through that by by just appreciating those little gains and you know, and there's, there's a lot of other things I could add to that on answering the why questions. But I mean, one of those certainly is, is just being able to appreciate the small things. Yeah. I, I really uh, identified with, with, with what you just said with mountain climbing, right. Mm -hmm. And like, especially on the mountain, like Mount Everest, it's so grand. It's so massive. There's so much danger. And, and again, I don't want to compare it in any way to your injury, but just in terms of the mental uh, component of it, of having to, you know, it's literally one step at a time and you go up yeah. and you go back one, you go up two and you come back one and, and the whole breathing thing and everything else. And, and to me, it's just always about just focus on that day, not yeah. the outcome and, and, you know, having those little wins uh, will get you to the eventual summit. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you try to like, look at it and like, Oh my God, there's just no way it gets yeah. too overwhelming for your brain. And so yeah. I really like the way you're, you're thinking about it in terms of, and you've gone about it in your life, uh, you know, inch by inch, step by step and understanding the, the bigger picture um, because it all counts at the end of the day. And look, the other thing I say too, is hard things are hard, right? Mm -hmm. And if it was easy, you know, anybody can do it. And for, especially to, to become in your case and that 1% is, is magical. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, you know, there's no shortcuts to the top. You got to put in the hard work and that's just the way it is, you know, from your rugby career to other things you do in your life to, you know, overcoming this physical challenge today in terms of, uh, we, I, I, we, we came together because I know you do a lot of speaking and that yeah. type of thing. I'm sure that's been really rewarding to get in front of people, share your story. Uh, what has that done for you? It's, it's amazing. And that's really what the purpose of my life is now is, is to share this story as a speaker, it's certainly not something that I ever saw myself doing before my injury. And, you know, when this all came about, people would come up and say, you know, Robert, you've got an amazing story. 
And you tell it so well, you should think about this being a career for you one day. Um, you know, I thought that was, that was pretty attractive. That was pretty enticing to, and, and really reveals that purpose behind, behind this challenge and, and how I can turn it into a positive thing, not just something that, that threw me on my back, but, you know, something that, that I've been able to use as, as a platform and, and a blessing and something that I was, I was grateful to have in my life um, because of this injury. And um, so I was invited to give a few speeches first, just at like classes and groups and organizations around Cal's campuses. And you know, then for larger corporations, like um, I was doing an internship with Intel and, um, and they asked that I would come in and speak to all of America's and South America's operations team. And, you know, with, with the underlying message of overcoming adversity and that my challenges are visible, you can look at me and you can see someone who goes through a lot every single day, but everybody has a challenge. And I'll also go to say that everybody's paralyzed by something, you know, whether that be mental or emotional, there, there's something that stops us from being our best. And so I did is I got together with my coach, Jack Clark, who is uh, an incredible rugby coach, an incredible culture consultant and speaker and, and cares about, you know, me, my success and my story so much. We sat down every week for over a semester. I mean, just like d going after every word and putting together my experiences and these tools that have helped me overcome this challenge that I can give to other people to overcome adversities and also just reach new heights and accomplish new goals that they have in their lives. And it's turned, it's turned into my life's life's mission to share this story. And I actually just dusted off the last chapter, the first draft of the manuscript for my book, which I'm really excited to release sometime down the road. And I mean, I, it's, it's revealed the purpose for me. And I mean, every single time I get done with one of these speeches, I'm just thinking like, when's the next one? You know, yeah, when, yeah. when can I do this again? It's, it's just so fulfilling. And I mean, it, it just shows like that full picture of how, when you, when you work with something like this through to battle through an adversity or, or accomplish a goal and, and you find a way to have it help somebody else, not just yourself, but, but somebody else as well, then, you know, then that reveals true purpose. Love that. Love that. I know you have a website. Where can people find you? Yeah. So websites, robertpaylor.com. And then um, I'm on all the major social media platforms, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I've kind of got a monopoly on the name Robert Paylor. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not too, too hard to find me, but um, you know, I post my, my daily rehab videos and my Instagram stories. And I think that's something that's really, really like important to see and remember is it's not just about the big milestones and the PRs and, you know, when everybody, everybody sees the glorious moments, but it's about putting in that dedicated, consistent work every day, whether, whether you're feeling happy or you're feeling sad or whatever's going on in life, like not, not giving up, not quitting and just, just being consistent with it. It doesn't always have to be, you know, intense and for long periods of time, but, but consistent. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what I hope to instill in other people's lives. And it's, it's been a lot of fun too. Love it. Love it. Love it. Words of a true warrior. Thank you for that. So look at, appreciate you coming on. You are an inspiration. You know, I mean, there, you're probably just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of your potential of all these different things you can do uh, physically mentally, spiritually, uplifting other people. So congrats to you. It's been a wonderful conversation. You're a bright light. So keep charging. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. That means the world to me. Absolutely. All right. There is the one, the only Robert Paler. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, nfl.com. So... Until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.
This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.